Our next speaker wrote recently that the only thing that is really going to change dramatically is the number of columns from hacks predicting that everything is going to change. So what should brands be doing right now and in that recession, which we know is coming? Mark Ritson is in-house professor for LVMH. He's also a brand consultant and a former marketing professor. He's got a PhD in marketing and has taught on the MBA programs of leading business schools and around the world. And the 16th of April, Mark, you may not know this, is not only World Voice Day, uh, now, for many of us, that's tomorrow, but for you, it's actually today, as you're joining us from mm -hmm. Tasmania. But Mark, it's also wear your pajamas to work day. Uh, given the time it is there, I'm surprised that you're not taking advantage of that right now. You, you haven't seen my lower half, Edie. You've no <laughs> idea what I've got on down here, right? Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, so let me get through this, and we'll do. Then let's have a chat, shall we? Um, uh, last but by no means least, um, I wanted to share with you some uh, uh, data on brands uh, in times of trouble, which we are surely in at the moment. So you're about to see, and, and Edie's kind of already spoken about it a little bit, you're about to see all this nonsense. Um, if we had any conferences going on, you'd get it from conferences. So we're seeing it in the news media and magazine media and social media instead. Someone with... with uh, with a bit of time to kill and an opinion, will write in the next four or five weeks that coronavirus will change blah, forever. And that blah, could be media, consumption, fashion, the way we work, politics, uh, the way we eat, uh, the way we shop, on and on and on it goes. Uh, and, and the point is none of that is true, right? It's just nonsense. It's what happens when people are forced to sit at home and try and write something that will grab headlines at the time. The reality is that although this current very strange lockdown is a time of great strangeness, it will come to an end eventually. And when it does, society and culture will snap back relatively quickly. We'll wash our hands for four seconds, not four minutes. Uh, and all of this stuff that people are predicting is going to change dramatically will not change at all. Um, Having said that, for the next few weeks and possibly months, you're going to have to put up with what I call NUMA bullshit, which NUMA is kind of the wind of change that a person perceives will come. It never does, but they're perceiving it as something they want. If you want to see a more egalitarian society, you'll somehow find a way of showing that coronavirus will deliver that when it ends. If you want to see um, uh, fresher air and a more... Uh, decent treatment of animals, et cetera, et cetera. So in all these cases, what you're seeing is people attaching a, um, uh, a happy ending to something that won't be happy. And the reason I can say that with some degree of certainty, and by the way, it's not a very sexy message, right? It's much sexier to talk about the whole world of work and consumption changing. The boring message from me, which is almost certainly true, which is not much is going to change at all, uh, the normal trends will continue um, uh, is much less sexual, but much more true. Um, Bill Birnbach, the greatest ad man who ever lived, talked about it 50 years ago. He said, look, you know, he's, uh, even back in the 60s, people talked about how the consumer was changing. And Birnbach said, look, it took millions of years for man's instincts to develop. It will take millions more for them to even vary. It's fashionable to talk about the changing man or changing woman. A communicator must be concerned with unchanging man, with his obsessive drive to survive, to be admired, to succeed, to love, to take care of his or her own. And Bernback is surely right. We, we, we aren't changing that much. Um, obviously, the stimulus around us is, but we're far less likely to change. Jeff Bezos, who knows a thing or two about change. I very frequently get the question, what's going to change in the next 10 years? And that is a very interesting question. It's a very common one. I almost never get the question, what's not going to change in the next 10 years? And I submit to you that the second question is actually the more important of the two because you can build a business strategy around the things that are stable in time. So again, Edie mentioned this already. I live in Australia. I actually live in Tasmania, which for those of you who are geographically challenged, I'm currently sitting in a small library here on the southern tip of the southern island 
of the southernmost point other than the South Pole, uh, Tasmania. Uh, you are almost certainly watching this from somewhere else west and north of me on the planet right now. And that's super important because uh, we're in two different places. You're in the place that we often refer to as yesterday. Uh, it's still Wednesday with you, whereas where I'm currently sitting here, we're actually in Thursday, which is more commonly known as the future. And so what I want to share with you all is, is what's going to happen in the future because I'm in it uh, and you're not. So um, what's coming next is not going to be some gigantic, exciting, different phase of society and culture. What's going to happen after this very odd period of COVID lockdown is we're going to have a massive recession. How long it will go and how deep it will go, we cannot possibly predict, but it is going to be a big one. And that's weirdly good news because we know a lot about recessions. And like COVID-19, um, we know tons about recessions because we've had many of them over the last century. And it's even better news because in marketing and business, we have two very good weapons to fight against a recession. Uh, the first one is strong brands and the second one is, is advertising. So let, let me talk about those before we, f before we open for questions. There's a great index done of brand valuation by Kantar, the market research company, and they measure brand strength. So what are the strongest brands? And what they've been doing now for nearly 15 years is measuring the strongest brands using consumer research and buying a portfolio of those brands each year uh, and buying the stock that owns the brands, building a portfolio based on brand strength. Uh, it's really been rather successful. If, uh, if, you'd have been, uh, if you'd have bought into the Brand Z top 10 most powerful portfolio back in 2006, uh, you'd have tripled your portfolio uh, as of the end of 2019. Whereas if you just have invested in the S&P 500, you'd have barely made 30%. So you get a sense here that you know brand, brands are indeed, particularly in stable times, very useful. And here's actually how the data looks. So that purple index is the top 10 and the orange one is the top 50 uh, brands according to Brand Z. And there you see them outperforming in terms of share price, the other indices. But I'd like to focus on the one period that sticks out because it's a decline period. You'll see it there. That's the period when, um, of course, we had the GFC. So if we zoom into that period, here's the brand Z index and there's the S&P. You'll see that no surprise, if we benchmark it from 2006, the brand Z portfolio of very strong brands is outperforming the S&P. When the GFC hits, however, you'll see that both of them get pummeled with kind of equal force. There really isn't anything different about either of those uh, trajectories. But what we see once the recession ended around about early Q2 2009 is that the, the portfolio containing brand Z, strong brands, rebounded much more quickly. That's the key point. Brand equity gives you some defense in the recession, but an amazing spring broad when growth surely comes at the end of the recession. Now you might say, well, I haven't got a strong brand. What am I going to do about that? And, and that's a fair point. So let me finish with the other point, which is advertising. So there's a concept in advertising called ESOV, excess share of voice. It's super important and it's super simple. If you look at a brand's share of voice, what proportion of advertising in the total category belongs to them versus competitors? And then you look at their market share in that category, there is a remarkable equilibrium. Brands inevitably sit somewhere on the equilibrium. However, if a brand gets ambitious and starts spending more money, we may see a difference in ESOV. So all ESOV means is share of voice minus share of market. In this case, obviously it's 10 minus 10, which is zero. But let's say that brand gets ambitious. Let's say it doubles its marketing spend suddenly it has a 20% share of voice if the competitors don't respond. That means its ESOV is now plus 10 because 20 minus 10 is plus 10. What's interesting is over time, that excess share of voice will restore the equilibrium and lead that brand to eventually achieve a 20% share of market. And by the way, the negative is true. If a brand underspends, in this case, with a 10% share of voice and a 20% share of market, 
So an ESOV of minus 10. We will see the equilibrium again emerge triumphant eventually, according to the data, and the brand will snap back down the curve. Okay, so why is this important? In a recession, here's what happens. And let's keep that idea of ESOV. Let's say a brand, here again, 10% share of voice, 10% market share, spends $5 million a year on advertising. Now, here comes the recession. Most of the competitors either spend nothing, they go out of business, or they reduce their advertising spend. Let's say this brand doesn't and maintains its $5 million budget. Well, guess what happens? That equates to that same $5 million almost double the share of voice because everyone else is spending relatively less. The laws of ESOV still apply, and that brand will absolutely grow. Now, add another point here. Right now, as we're going through COVID lockdown, we're finding that audiences are 20, 30, 40% bigger than they were the same period last year. You're getting more eyeballs for your investment in advertising. And because media companies are struggling, you're getting it at a much lower price. Add all of that together, and what you realize if you know what you're doing is that the recession is a potent period to grow market share. And it's always been that way. We've been studying recessions in marketing for a century, starting with Roland Vale in 1927 in the HBR, and we find the same pattern without exception. Vale looked at firms during the 1920-21 recession that either increased advertising, did no advertising, or decreased advertising. And what he found is the firms that actually increased advertising versus the ones that decreased it had a 20% gain over their former growth rate. Same in the 74-75 Jimmy Carter recession. Again, we find exactly the same picture. The firms that did not cut their advertising budgets in either 74-75 versus those that did were up by a spectacular degree in terms of their overall sales index. Same in 1991. Look at the firms in gray here that maintained their spending on advertising versus the ones in black that cut spending. Look at the difference when we came out of that recession. Same in the 1980-81 uh, recession, according to uh, Stephen King and Alex Beale. Firms that decreased their, market, their ad spend um, uh, saw a flattening. Increasing your ad spend to your ESV, ESOV levels of less than 20% saw some growth. And if you actually increased your budget significantly during a session, you saw a massive change in market share. And finally, in the most recent GFC, GFC, GFC uh, crisis, the same story according to Peter Field. An ESOV of zero gets you a little bit of growth as other businesses go out of business. But if you do a zero to 8% ESOV, you got a 1.4% boost. And if you went over 8%, you saw a massive 4.5% boost. So in summary, as the FT so rightfully said back in the GFC, What's the first mistake businesses make in a global turndown in the recession that comes? They'll cut their advertising spend. So let me end with some uh, uh, weirdly and strangely comforting thoughts. Every moron with a column or a laser pointer is about to tell you that blah, blah, blah is going to change forever. It won't. We are going to enter a massive recession. Of that, there is no doubt. That's what's going to happen next. Strong brands will survive it better and rebound faster. And strong brands that maintain their advertising spend will grow share and sales. And they'll keep that share in that sales when the recession ends, which it surely will. Okay, that's my lot. I've finished um, and, and I'm over to you for questions, Edie. Sorry for rushing, but I wanted to get through it. Really fascinating. So, Mark, I wonder if you could give me, since you're in the future already, give me some predictions yes, about what are those uh, companies or what are the brands that we are going to be seeing increasing their advertising spending and thus doing better in the recession? Yeah, there's only a few, first of all. So it's interesting. Um, and, and I'm not just saying this to be coy. The CMOs I know, I know three CMOs very well that are all currently actually increasing budget spend. Uh, two in insurance, one in automotive, and all of them are very, very as well are increasing their advertising spend as well. I read. That's interesting. I know Lexus are in, on publicly in record of saying that they're maintaining it. Um, but yeah, I mean, there are brands that are doing it. They don't want to talk about it. I understand why. 
the reality is though most brands aren't and actually are frozen. I spoke to a CEO of a very famous luxury brand this morning and uh, he, he buys everything I'm saying and, and he's of the same opinion, but there's no way he's getting any money to spend on advertising in the near future because he's got no top line. So yeah, the story of, of why a few select brands are going to make a growth here is because most brands aren't. But yeah, I know Lexus are, and three very anonymous other large companies have actually increased their money so far, and they're in the select group. If you're not prepared to spend money advertising on billboards that nobody's going to see because nobody's driving at the moment, yeah. what about the email marketing? Because what I've noticed is that I get annoyed a bit when I get an email from somebody from a company that I've bought from before, a brand that I trust and like, but they don't even recognize what's going on right now. Whereas when I get an email advertising something, but they're saying we're switching things up, we acknowledge what's yeah. going on. How do you advise companies in terms of how to do their advertising now? Well, there's kind of three possibilities, right? On the one end, as you say, there are companies that are just carrying on regardless, and that feels weirdly out of touch right now. Then there's another bunch of companies that are all feeling the customer's pain and the CEO sending heartfelt messages and your email boxes, you know, deluged with concerned male CEOs who are very worried about how you're holding up and blah, blah, blah. And, and that's just generic mush as well. In the middle, there are a few brands that are, I think, flexing their muscles uh, and doing it right. They're getting on with business, but at the same time, they're getting on with business in a way which reflects the changing environment. But um, uh, probably KFC are doing very well at the moment in the way that they're, they've got a big social media presence at the moment, asking KFC lovers who are trying to make a version of fried chicken at home to send photos in and then KFC are basically just telling them that the chicken is shit. And uh, <laughs> it's terrific. It's terrific stuff. Like they're humiliating the users. What, um, this morning, the KFC accused one customer of having dandruff because there were white <laughs> specks all over this horrible piece of chicken. And the, the point is that's kind of fun. You know, okay, that's, okay, it's true to KFC's tone of voice. People get the joke and it reflects the kind, we need a bit of humor at the moment. What we don't need is another CEO with his sleeves rolled up telling everyone that he's worried and he hopes everyone's holding up well. So I think that's the balance. There's a sweet spot in the middle, Edie, where I think that we can reflect what's going on, but we can still speak with a tone of voice that's, that's accurate. And we can help in more genuine ways. Rather than just doing advertising, we can do things that are actually useful for consumers. So think about the last recession and think about a company that did increase its advertising that we know of now. What would that company be? Oh, shoot. There's a big, long list of them. I mean, if you go back through history, it's really interesting, actually. If you look at the corporate histories of many of the world's great companies, it's, it's a remarkable, uh, with remarkable frequency, what you'll see is during a particularly strong recessionary period, that company held the line. Um, we could talk about Marks and Spencer in the UK during World War II and the period after it, and how the combination of the war effort that they really committed to, they made most of British uh, fashion ration clothing, but also how they continued to grow uh, their presence really was the start of the Marks and Spencer domination period. We could talk about Wrigley's, who uh, it's not well known in the UK, but in the US it's very well known. Wrigley's basically gave all the gum to the troops during World War II um, uh, and essentially told American consumers that it was going to, 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 to serve a greater good. So you get these companies that really push hard. Procter & Gamble are famous. P&G are famous. They're, they are still among the best marketing companies in the world. Whenever a recession has come along, at least up until this one, P&G almost always double down and probably my favorite example is target the american retailer so target have just come off of probably the their best decade in their history uh, it's been down the last couple of years but it all stems from the gfc and target increasing their ad budgets about 20 percent um over the previous pre-recessionary year and they did that by squeezing money out of other areas to put more of it into advertising and this pattern you see each time is the same, which is, again, 
we're spending more on advertising, we're getting more share while others go backwards. And then when the growth comes, everybody starts spending again, but I keep the share that I've taken. So yeah, Target, certainly P&G, Marks and Spencer during the post-World War II recession, they're textbook case studies of companies that didn't just survive a recession, but came out of it in a dominant position. Thank you so much uh, for sharing those thoughts with us. And actually really interesting, you talked about the share of voice. And today for you is Voice Day, Global Voice Day. So yes. we really appreciate you staying up late to talk to us from the future. We'll let you now get back to wear your pajamas to work day as well.